Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Fighter Heart Podcast. I'm here with uh, Michael and Ashley. Um, thanks for taking the time, everyone. We're so honored yes. to be here. Thank you. Thanks Thank you for, for having, having us. us. It's a huge honor. Yeah, we love it. Yeah, so I would love to hear a little background about who you guys are um, and where you're from, you know, a little bit of your upbringing, but then get right into the, your Fire Heart story. So my name is Michael Kramer. I'm Ashley. I'm Michael's mom, actually. Yeah, and we are Michael and Mom Talk Cancer. We have actually have a podcast of our own, but originally where we are from is I was actually born in France. French father. Yes, and we grew I actually grew up in Miami, though, because when we were, I was two years old, we moved here. I was two years old, right? Yeah, you were about yeah. two. I was two years old, we moved here, I grew up in Miami, went to school here, did everything here. I was actually a surfer, I was a windsurfer, a student in college. And this was all before I was diagnosed with cancer because when the COVID lockdown had hit us in Miami, it was 2020 and I was really tired. And for a few months, this kind of this feeling of tiredness and exhaustion just like dragged on and we really didn't know what was going on. And we were just thinking maybe I was anemic. We Googled some things. We didn't really have a solid answer this is the joke we say is that i'm a vegan mom so you know he was like this healthy athletic 19 year old and maybe he wasn't getting like enough red meat oh wow <laughs> like almonds dark chocolate here get as much as you can but no when, when you say you were tired what do you mean like you just couldn't get out of bed for the whole day was it i was i was getting out of bed i was working out but i was losing weight and at the time, I was super athletic. I mean, I was on the Olympic development team for windsurfing. So I knew what it was like to work out tough and have those long days of rigorous hours on the water. And I was unable to do those things because I just felt so tired. Like I would go and I would go for a swim and I'd come back and I'd just be like, oh my God, I'm so tired. And I thought I was depressed, honestly. Yeah, it was COVID. COVID they, that hit. They couldn't see their friends they weren't socializing yeah it was a really really tough time and initially we went to my family a pediatrician we actually had a zoom with her first because we were just thinking okay maybe if we call her on a zoom she would tell us what's going on and you can get like a oh, maybe it was covid too because yeah. at that time getting tested was so hard like the lines you'd wait like 12 hours so i was like maybe it's covid it wasn't easy like today yeah and then we went to her in person. I did some blood work and it came back and she referred me to a specialist at Nicholas Children's Hospital. We went to Nicholas Children's Hospital. I mean, I was 19, but- We were happy me. they took him there though. Yeah. And <laughs> For a lot of reasons. It was great. I mean, not grand cancer was not great, but being there was definitely great. And I met this really kind doctor. He comes in, he, you know, he does some blood work and it doesn't, he doesn't really like what he sees and he comes back and he asks me to do a bone marrow biopsy. So the next day we come in, I do a bone marrow biopsy. And the next thing I know I'm being taken to the sixth floor of the hospital because the doctor walked in and told me I had cancer. Yeah. He didn't know exactly what kind of cancer. He just knew I had leukemia or lymphoma. And they were specifically testing for it or... Is there like a blood test that they do? I don't know how it was really. It was right. a bone marrow biopsy. So at the point, he was suspecting probably that I had some form of blood cancer or cancer. It went with the bone marrow biopsy from the blood work. Or he, blood. Su he suspected yeah. cancer. Mm. After that, he did the biopsy and the biopsy showed cancer, but they could only tell it was a blood cancer. It takes about 24, usually 24 to 48 hours to pinpoint exactly what type of blood cancer but it took it took almost three weeks because Michael ended up being diagnosed with a super rare cancer. And I I know he was probably about to say this, but the uh, the other hard part of the story is that so Michael was born in France. Mm -hmm. I've got three kids. He's the middle one, Stephen, Michael, Jennifer. And um, but four years prior to this, my husband passed away from large B cell lymphoma from cancer. So, you know, 
different signs and ended up being a very different cancer. But still, when he came in and said to us, he said leukemia looks like, or possibly lymphoma, we were like, no possible yeah. way. Were you it's getting like flashbacks of, oh, yeah. yeah, of four years prior? And it was just shocking that, you know, this was a kid. He was 19. He was yeah. 19. And they made you wait three weeks. That's, that's well, they didn't well, make they no. didn't make yeah, yeah. But but like you had to wait three weeks. Like that's yeah, that was really really tough. That waiting time, you know. We were just thinking, what if I have a cancer that's really treatable and then I finish soon? Or what if I have something that's not even cancer? We were thinking because you know there was a point where we were thinking, what if they got it wrong? And there were all these it's taking so long. We're like, well, maybe there were all I don't these know. thoughts. And those three weeks were super hard, but initially, I mean, I was diagnosed August 3rd of 2020 with hepatosplenic T cell lymphoma. And the doctor just told me I needed to go through two to six rounds of chemotherapy and then a bone marrow transplant. Wow. Yeah, it, it was tough. It, and it was. And, and, you know, it wasn't them making us wait. It was actually initially. I think within like 48 hours, they did diagnose him correctly. We didn't find this out until much later, but because it's such a rare cancer, the pathologist of the hospital was like, I've never seen this cancer before. I want you to take this, this sample and send it to other pathologists to make sure that okay. I'm not diagnosing him. So it wasn't them, like they were, they were searching. They, they ended up having a, a team of about six doctors on this you know, from around the country, not yeah. just Miami, because it is a really rare cancer. But what goes through your mind at that time when they tell you exactly what you have? I mean, they told us not to Google it. Yeah, it was just full survival mode. Just do what the doctors told me to do. And I was just thinking, okay, I just need to get through this. You know, I'm going to find a way to get through it. We're going to get through it together. And, you know, we had, I had no choice. You know, it was just something I had to deal with. And it was really hard. But, you know, we just found a way to keep going and we relied on each other a lot. And it was hard. It was the hardest thing, you know, ever to go through. But, you know, we just we believed I was going to make it through it. We had a lot of hope. And, you know, it's true. We didn't Google it until much, much later. Wow. You knew the fact when someone says to you, don't when an oncologist says don't Google it, you kind of yeah. know the fact yeah. that we've never heard of it. And other people's reactions that we told what he had, I knew, looked it up. And I just, we knew it was a tough one. But, you know, I don't know. Talk about fighter heart. The thing about Michael was incredible to me when he was diagnosed. He never sat there. I'm not going to say it wasn't hard. I'm not going to say he was like, oh, oh, yes, let's go. But he never really questioned why. We just kind of went into it like, okay. This is what we've been dealt. Let's let's go for it. And I think having been through it, sadly, but having been through it with my husband, with his dad, I think it prepared us a lot. Gave us a lot more. I don't. I don't want to say motivation, but perspective in a way. Yeah, mm. a lot of perspective and a lot of okay. Didn't do it right the first time. Maybe this time we're gonna get it right. I don't know. Yeah. So what was your what was your game plan from then on? Like you said, you had to get six rounds of chemo. So it actually ended up being it was two to six, he said. So oh. it was two, two through six. And I ended up doing three. So kind of in the middle there. And then I had my bone marrow transplant and the bone marrow transplant was pretty crazy. You know, we were in the hospital for six weeks. I was prepped with radiation, chemotherapy. It was extremely, extremely intense. And I you know, I vomited over like 30, 40 times in the hospital. I popped blood vessels in my eyes. It was really difficult. He was on a morphine drip for pain. I remember yeah. we had to convince him, but he couldn't swallow like the mouth sores. And yeah, so it was, it was really hard. I have videos of that time and I have videos of myself making just like to document it. Just like, I look like, oh my God, I'm in so much pain just watching and that's really it was hard to see yeah. everything he went through yeah and very scary because before if you don't know what a bone marrow transplant is they wipe you out they completely wipe you out so that you can replace that bone marrow and so you're zero zero immunity zero everything 
like what I I have my own vision of what a bone marrow transplant is. I think they remove your bone marrow, but that's not what they no. do. Right? Yeah, it's like they, what actually is. Yeah, they just destroy your bone marrow by destroying like your your blood counts with chemotherapy. They don't. It's not a surgery. It's actually an infusion, is what it is. And what they do is they do radiation chemotherapy, and the radiation and chemotherapy puts your white blood cells to zero. Mm-hmm. So you have like no immune system anymore. And when you have a no immune system, that's when they infuse you with the donor's immune system. And the goal is that it becomes yours. And it's like planting a seed in you. I was just going to say that. That was so good. Yeah. I was about to say that. It's like there's like a forest and then they wipe out the forest and then they plant new seeds and they have to yeah. grow. And it takes time for them to grow, which is why you're in the hospital for a while while you engraft. And while the seeds start to grow and you get discharged while they're still growing, you're not completely better, but how long, long, so how long were you in the hospital for after the transplant? So I was there for six weeks Okay. and then we went home and I was back for another two weeks after we went home because I developed graft versus host disease, which is what I live with now. So basically the donor stem cells were rejecting my body you know, fighting my major organs. And it's it's pretty common. It's like 50% of people will get GVHC after the transplant. And I now live with chronic GVHC. Well, 50% of people get it, but there's different variations. Right. <laughs> like there's different variations. Levels of it. Like it can be deadly, which that's happened to him a couple of times. We weren't sure he was going to make it. And it can be light, uh, you know, and now he's living with it and still treated and still in the hospital, you know, this week. We're there a bunch of times, but yeah. still and in the hospital a couple of times usually. Do you still have lymph the lymphoma? Lymphoma? No, I'm in remission, thankfully. Oh wow. So it's like you traded off basically. Right. In a way, yes. Wow. Trade one disease for another. Oh. I mean, how do you so how do you feel right now? Well, you know, it's I'm emotional, but you know, I'm alive and you know, it's a blessing. Oh, totally. Awesome. Perspective. Yeah. yeah. Perspective is huge. Like we just have, you know, we do a lot of advocacy and we do a lot of support groups. Like we lead support groups. Both of us give back a lot because we've just gone through so much and feel like we've been given so much, you know, going back to the hospital, you know, they've treated us like family the amount of time. Michael didn't say this, but at one point for the graft versus host disease for five months straight, he was admitted to the hospital. We were not sure if he was going to make it. We spent five months living there. And that was a really, that was a hard time. That was in 2022. Wow. So not long ago. Last yeah. year. Yeah. No, it's kind of crazy, but been out of the hospital for over a year now. And for that first day. For- Go for treatment. Yeah, but... I still have treatment, but it's outpatient. Great. Yeah. So that first day you went home after six months, you know, like, what did you do? Did you feel like you were free or how did it feel? Well, that's always, people always, you know, think that, but it's it was hard because when you're in the hospital for so long, you get used to it. And then going home is like going to the hospital because it's scary. It's like, oh, really? It, yeah. Because you get comfortable in the hospital. And it becomes a place where it's not great, but it's safe. And home doesn't feel safe because if you get sick, you know, what are you going to do? Like you have to go to the hospital. So you, it felt safe in the hospital. So the first few days at home were really tough, the first few weeks. And then after that, it got better. And, and now it's, like, you know, hard to imagine going back. We've spent so much time, especially those first two years after his plans, like we, like we lived in the hospital yeah. more than we were at home. And now it's kind of the reverse, of course. Now we're so happy. We're outpatient. We're like, oh my God, we hope he doesn't get admitted to the hospital exactly. again. But it is true. There is a safety when you're in the hospital. And well, you know, in the back of your mind, you know, if anything goes wrong, that you're in the right place. There's nothing, nowhere else you could go besides the hospital that would help you. So yeah. you have that safety in the back of your mind. So how long did it take you after you got home to feel comfortable again? I'd say a few weeks, you know, it took a while. I mean, it took a few weeks to make me feel like I'm used to being at home, but it took a few months even to get back to feeling like myself. But it took a few weeks to feel like normal. Like, I'm okay, this is home, this is my routine. You know, it's like anything, you know, when you change a habit, it takes a while to get used to it. 
Yeah, 21 days, right? That's what they say to build a house. Some people say 21, some say 30. I don't know, but one of those. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the 10,000 hours thing, that's also, yeah. that's yeah. I've heard that's a myth as well. Um, yeah. So to rewind a little bit, um, when they told you, like before you had the bone marrow transplant, they told you, obviously, like there's a 50-50 chance it won't go, it, 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 what will happen to you is what will happen, right? Like, I forgot the name of the disease. That you they had. actually didn't say that. No. They were more like, there's a possibility this could happen. Uh, but they didn't, like, specifically tell me the statistics. They just said it was yeah. a possibility. Yeah. And they also, we also knew that a little bit of graft versus OCD is a good thing. Because it's what they also say, you know, it's like graft versus cancer. So when you get a little bit of it, it's also the new bone marrow is like attacking the cancer, which is good. So it's preventing the cancer from coming back. Right. But then too much starts to attack all your major organs yeah. and reject your body. And that not just rejecting the cancer, but rejecting your body. And that's, so it's just like, you know, we've learned that medicine is definitely way more art. We feel like it's more art in balance than science. There's a lot of science in there, but like, there's a lot of art in there as well. And every patient is different and every patient reacts differently. And then there's also your emotional state and there's like so many factors to medicine. So, yeah, it's true. Yeah. So um, what, um, I, I, like your white blood cell count, like now, is it at a normal air, uh, range? Yes. Oh, so you're just, okay, that's great. White blood cells are <laughs> normal, red blood cells are low. Yeah. Oh. I mean, I'm Why is that? Yeah. Because I'm immunosuppressed, so they have to suppress my immune system to keep it like calm down, you know, because it's overactive is what GVHC really is. That is what cancer is, right? Too many white blood cells? I, I, that's what I always learned. Yes, a so, lot of So they have to make sure it doesn't... Yes. It. That makes sense. Are you able to be active now at all? A little bit. I mean, I have necrosis, which is from, I was on steroids and the necrosis like destroyed my joints. Not steroids, like high yeah. performance. No, no, yeah. yeah. I'm thinking, exactly. I'm thinking Barry Bonds and Mark McGuire. No, they're like prednisone yeah. to combat the, the graft GHD versus and OCD the cancer. And the cancer. And then it didn't work out for you. What did you say it did to you? Well, it, it did help me at the time, but there's a side effect from it. And that side effect, it can destroy your joints. And it destroyed my joints, basically leaving me with, like, I need my knees replaced. I need my elbows replaced, ultimately. Like, I can walk. I can do some things. But there's a lot of things I can't do, like run, jog, jump, those mm -hmm. types of things. But do you take walks daily? Yes, I do. And your energy levels, how are they? They're, I'm overall have, like, some fatigue. But it's okay. Because low red blood cells, I suppose. Yeah. It has to be yeah. Yeah. But he has good energy too. Yeah. I mean, I'm a super energetic person. I was so gonna, I mean, yeah. <laughs> when he's like a little low energy, at least he gets my genetics that his really low energy is probably somebody else's normal day. But <laughs> he, it is tiring. Graft versus those disease is chronic fatigue is one of the side effects. Okay. So, so what, what's your diet? Are you still are you vegan? No, no. <laughs> Just the, yeah just you. the only really the only real meat i can eat is chicken because my stomach is like i'm on a lot of medications and my stomach is not the best so chicken is the easiest on my stomach i can't really tolerate like steak or beef oh wow i low, guess low fat, pretty much and that's because he doesn't have a gallbladder anymore and because of like liver issues so it's harder to digest anything that's fatty not that he ever ate like really bad food before but mm -hmm. yeah you have a pretty healthy diet. It's just a little bit limited. Yeah. You know. All right. So you're coming back. It's okay. better than IV nutrition that he was on for a long time. At yeah. least he can eat food. Oh, my God. I can't imagine that. Can you explain kind of what it was like living with an IV for that long? Oh, it was tough. I mean, they would feed me through it, and that was hard. It was, it smelled nasty. I, was I wasn't say. eating. Wait, they, it's, it smells what it, what is it what are they using well it's a it's a big yellow bag they put and it goes up with your pole you know you have a pole that's like attached to you and 
and they just put it in the pole and it's this big yellow bag with lipids and fats and they infuse it into you yeah so you feel yourself get full like food yeah you feel like you're not hungry you know like you could you 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 do have an appetite maybe a little bit but you don't want to eat you know like you feel full wow it does smell it's so weird so there was like a yellow bag and then there's like a white bag because one of them has more like vitamins and proteins and one of them has more lipids and fats. So, but it's really weird. Like you think they're in these bags, so you're not going to smell it, but you do. No. I know. <laughs> <laughs> you, you get used to it. Yeah. I mean, now you're done with it. That's good. Yeah. Uh, Let's knock on wood. <laughs> yeah. Same. Um, so I know you guys also have a podcast. Um, when did you have that idea to start? It was about nine, eight months after the transplant. Yeah. One of my friends, uh, a cancer friend, actually, he started a podcast and we were talking about it before and we were like, you know, he did it. We should do it too. So we ended up starting a podcast. It was 2021 around August. No, I think it was earlier. I think it was like May. Are you sure? Yeah. Maybe. We just started out by telling the story and that was what we were going to do is tell the story and then maybe stop. Yeah. And then we did a few podcasts and then I got sick. So we stopped and then now we're back to it. And now we interview people. Sometimes it's just the two of us and sometimes we interview people. We yeah. do, we do both. Yeah. What is the name of your podcast and where can people see it? It's Michael and mom talk cancer. It's on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. It's pretty much everywhere. And it's on YouTube as well. Yeah, we have a website, Michael and Mom Talk Cancer. So if you yeah. go to michaelandmomtalkcancer.com, the podcast is there. Yeah. But yeah. it's like, yeah. everywhere you can find podcasts, you can usually, you can pretty much find it. And we can expect to see um, interviews and conversations with you guys, with um, people from all different walks of life or like specifically medical or? It's mainly medical. It's mainly cancer survivors yeah because it's michael and mom taught cancer so we do interview mainly cancer survivors we've talked to some people that are like someone a caregiver that has a foundation a few people like that that are caregivers or people that have foundations but it's been more around cancer although he and i sometimes we do podcasts just the two of us Mm -hmm. and we do more motivational like stuff we've learned and i think that's kind of for everyone out there because cancer is Whatever else you can say about it, it's been an incredible teacher. It's given us so much perspective on life. And I think that's like the gift of it. We we, we say that it's like the beauty and the pain mm-hmm. because the pain, well, it's definitely there. It doesn't change the pain, but you can find so much beauty in it. And I think that's been our biggest lesson is not denying how hard it is. But then there's just been so many beautiful things like meeting you today, like exactly. meeting Ed, like fight our heart. The people that we have met, it's just, it's mind boggling. The relationships, the connections that we've made because of this. Very, so. very inspiring guys. Very cool. Thank you. I mean, time's flown by. We're almost, we're almost out of time, but I oh want to <laughs> talk a lot. It's almost 30 minutes already. Um, I just want to know, Michael, um, and Ashley as well, I guess you can give some advice on this too, to uh, someone that was in your position, Mike, and maybe his parents, his mom, um, what advice would you give to both of them um, to get through this, maybe make it a little easier on them? One of the best things, if you want to get through something like cancer, is to have the support, you know, and to find someone else who has been through it and talk to them. You know, I lead a support group, and being able to talk to people who have been through or you have been through, it makes you feel so much less alone. So if you can look online and find support groups, I mean, I lead one, so you can go to mine, but, or reach out to me on Instagram or wherever. But if you need to talk to someone, you should, because it, it will help you. It makes you feel less alone. I literally, he, I, we share that perspective. I think that that is the biggest thing is letting people know that you're not alone because I think a lot of times we're going through this and we think we're the only one going through it. And it's hard because the people that you love can't quite understand all the time. So I think it really has been important for Michael. We love each other. We get along great. We do a podcast. We live together. We're BFFs. But 
he has his support group and that's amazing for him to talk to other cancer survivors. I actually have a support group for caregivers. Plus I reach out to a lot of caregivers. And I think that that's great for me too, because he can't quite understand his piece and my piece. I can't quite understand his piece. And I think it's really important to know you're not alone. And it's important to like, just you're, you can't, and like toxic positivity, just get rid of it. Yes. That's what I was going to say. What to, what do you avoid? Toxic positivity. Like it's, we are positive and we have, you know, we do a lot of helping other people and we are very optimistic. We are very grateful for so many things. We talk about gratitude a lot and love, like love has healed so much, but it's still not a cure. And there are still, you know, crappy moments and you have to go through those crappy moments and accept them as well to make room for the good moments. That's, you know. Yin and yang, right? You can't have the good without the bad. Yeah, exactly. and you can't deny the bad. Like it sucks, but it's also given us like we cannot deny all the wonderful things that have come out of it as well so yeah. guys thank you so much michael and ashley kramer thank, thank you, you so much we're going to make sure we go to your podcast and check it out and your social medias is it the same it's well mine is just my name it's michael reed kramer and yours is ashley kramer yeah, like on Instagram, you can find us. If you go to the if you go to the website, Michael and Mom Cancer.com, you can find us. Um, but Michael Reed Kramer on Instagram, you'll find a lot and and you'll find me as well. Beautiful. Thanks so much, guys. Thank uh, you. Everyone else, thanks for listening to another Fighter Heart podcast, and we will see you next time.